This podcast is brought to you by Kiefer Her. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on kieferher.com. Hi, I'm Renee. And I'm Donna. Welcome to the Key for Her podcast. In this series, we aim to educate and open up honest conversations with both medical professionals and real life women. We want to shine a light on those topics that sometimes go unspoken about and help empower women to know what is key for their health and well being. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Key for Her podcast. Today, Renee and I are talking to Lisa McFarland. Lisa is the UK and Ireland's leading relationship coach and founder of Relationship Coaching Northern Ireland. She's a wife and mother to three children. Thank you for joining us today, Lisa, and lovely to meet you in person. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. (laughs) It's great to have you on, Ren. We were talking briefly before we got going there. Um, This is a topic that we, we touch on through every episode and it's so important and the core to most of our lives. So I think we're, uh, Ren and I are both so excited to have you here. So we can talk (laughs) in depth all about relationships, how they impact our lives at different life stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, So Lisa, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you get, how you got started and your coaching sessions you offer around relationship coaching and therapy, everything. First of all, I'll apologize. I have had the horrendous flu over Christmas and it has left me with a beautiful cough that just creeps up on me every now and again. But I have, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get there. You'd have to just ignore the little coughs here and there. I think no everybody problem. was sick around Christmas <laughs> and the little ones seem to be coming home with everything. Oh, I know, I know. Okay, so my journey started out of need, of necessity, which I think most of the good journeys do start out of. Mm. My hubby and I had a bus- have a business together um, and it was just becoming oof, heavy, really a lot, just heavy. Our kids, I, I have to change this in my bio. My kids, my two of my kids are big people now. Two of my kids are 20 and 21 and I have a 14 year old. So I'll have to change the kids one to semi adults or something. <laughs> anyway, they were, the two girls were teenage. It was just, life was a lot. Life was a lot. I had been to therapy a few years before that when my mum had passed away. Find it really beneficial, grief therapy. Really, yes. really beneficial. So um, my husband and I were just, oh, we've all done this. You know, we were just arguing about the same thing over and over again, never really coming to a resolution. Neither of us were really feeling heard. We ju- and it was just all work, work, work. Yeah. yeah. No play. No. So we call it parenting. So like, parenting all the time or working and that was it so I said you know what let's go and talk to somebody we can, we can fix this we love each other dearly he was like mm, not so keen on that we love each other we should be able to figure this out for ourselves I was like mm. book the appointment we went under the like we'll just go once and we'll see what it's like didn't tell anybody shame and guilt was horrendous we went once and both of us just drove home in the car going how have we even got this freaking far without this information? Like we're together 25 years now. And that stuff she told us today was like, oh my days, how have we never known this? Was it like basic stuff? Just that because you were so busy parenting and working that you never stopped to think about or? Well, one of the things she said was, you work together. So make a plan in work of when you're going to have a meeting. And then when you come home from work, don't talk about work at home. And my mind was like, what now? I had grown up with parents who just constantly talked about work, who just, you know, that was the, that, that was really all the conversation we had in our house, talking about feelings, talking about that wasn't what happens. I was like, we've just paid her money to tell us the most simple thing in the world. Yeah. Different if we weren't working together and you have to have that check in time with each other. But our talking about work led into, no, I don't think you did that right. No, well, if I had dealt with it, I would have dealt with it totally differently. Yeah. Mm. Which is not helping. Mm. He then told us about our love languages. 
together 25 years and didn't know what my love language was which We're is so, so interesting interested in this. <laughs> yeah tell us more about this love oh. language thing well there was three there's so there's a love language and there's your attachment style and then there's your argument style okay again she talked to us about her argument style I was like there's a healthy way to have arguments. What the freaking hell are you talking about here? So I was a huffer. I had been, so you know, huffing, <laughs> stonewalling. <laughs> so I'm a reformed huffer. But like when I tell you I'm a huffer, like I was a pro. Like I was really good. Like I was that one that when the visitors came and then left, I went back to huffing again after they So left. is the huffing the silent treatment and just mm-hmm. huffing for, and just not giving in <laughs> and letting it go? Is it? Right. Cold, shoulder, cold shoulder, silent treatment, but I could have done days. Oh, wow. Okay. You're a champion in huffing. Okay. Champion. So she talked to me about that. I huffed with her a little bit when she told me I couldn't huff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually said, are you huffing with me right now? And I went, uh-huh. And she said, okay, we're going to have to bring that three-year-old who's behaving like a three-year-old and we're going to have to bring her into this mature relationship. Again, I was like, what now? So <clears throat> that was me. I was like a dog with a bone. I was like, what the hell? We have to get this sorted out. So him and I went three times, fixed us, fixed us, made us better than ever. Brilliant. Best money I've ever spent in my life. Yeah. What you're saying right there is really interesting because for couples that actually genuinely need therapy, if, if they heard that there's possibility especially I think sometimes for the guy when the woman wants to drag him to it. Mm-hmm. If there was a possibility that they'd only actually, maybe only have to go three times, mm-hmm. it might get them yeah. actually going. It's just, I'm only saying, even just go once. But like, if, if it was only three times, there, there could be a chance that there could be a lot of relationships saved. I, I generally only couple, coach couples three or four times. Wow. As, sometimes I coach couples once and they come back and they go, it's fixed. Get it. You might come back and see you again in a couple of months. And I always recommend that keeps you accountable, but they're like, just that thing that you said about healthy conflict, it has just changed the way we communicate. Hmm. Yeah. So generally I see couples about three times. Then we will maybe take a break for a month and I see you people again. And then maybe I wouldn't see them for six months or I never see them again. But it's not, this is not a lifelong thing, especially coaching. Coaching is about what I do. Coaching is about giving the tips and tools that you implement into your life. I always, I say to guys, if it's a heterosexual couple, I'll say, you've been playing with your right foot. I'm going to teach you how to play with your left now. And it's going to make life so much easier for you. Okay. (laughs) All these little analogies that probably like sink in so much easier than like a whole big pep talk. Oh yeah. I can't be bothered with all that. So let's go back. So, you know, you had done the sessions, the two of you, you came out of that in a really positive place. And then what happened then? So, you know, how you the still universe- had the business, right? Yes. You still had you the know, business. And- no, 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 no. I didn't have, so we still had our business together. So yeah. we just fixed that. We just um, compartmentalized that. And I took my bit, he took his bit. We just made really healthy boundaries around the business. Then during that time in the business, an opportunity came for me to do my life coaching course. It was like a perfect storm. You know how the universe brings you these perfect Mm -hmm. storms. So I had this opportunity to do a life coaching course. I had huge limiting beliefs about my own ability to do this course. And in the middle of all of that, I also had a little semi, like everything has to change. I'm probably thinking now it was probably perimenopause where I was having a little midlife crisis um, of... I came away from church. I came away from lots of friends that I didn't really feel that I was able to be myself with. You know, I'm quite a lot, girls, you know, quite a lot. <laughs> and I'm no longer ashamed of it. Um, it brings up big changes, though, doesn't it? It does. As it well. does. Yeah. Thinking back, now it was probably Perry, but didn't really realize. So I was a little bit lost in the woods. All this new information had come to me. I was doing the life coaching, had to life coach myself through the life coaching course. And then I just decided that, Everyone needs to know this stuff. Everyone needs to know. mm -hmm, Go ahead. I love that you made this huge decision. Um, Like you're saying in and around your perimenopause, the kids are getting a bit bigger (laughs) and you're probably thinking, right, you know, it's been all work, 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 all parenting. And now it's time to do something that you actually enjoy. Was that where you were at? Let me tell you a terrible thing. 
I didn't want to be one of those moms that mm-hmm. their kids left and they just let their hair grow gray. And not that I have any problem with that. Let your hair grow gray. I don't care. Um, I just didn't want to be one of those moms that trips around after my children. I mm-hmm. wanted to live out the rest of my life to my highest potential. I had Love done, it. I've done my job with my kids. As I always say, once they get to about 16, 17, it's advisory level only. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's you know. such a great way. And but the, I think the problem is accepting that it's probably kind of difficult at that point, right? Because mm-hmm. there must be huge psychological changes that go on once the kids don't need yeah. you as much. Yeah. I, personally, I love teenaging. I love teenaging with them. It just took me right back to the I loved it. Um, I also could really sympathize because I had not the best teenage part of my life. So I just wanted them to be secure and happy and mm. feel supported. So I actually loved teenaging but better than when they were tiny. And I also find when you're teenaging, you can be more yourself. You can be like, okay, this is not going to work. Okay, yeah. we need to get the ground rules down here and we're just going to sort this out. But I did have in the back of my head, I know I need something for me. So in January... So sorry, I'll go back a little bit. So what I did was I took all my life coaching stuff and relationship stuff and I trained the girls in work. So we have about about 50 employees then. So I say girls, there's two guys. I trained the people in work. I trained the people in work uh, a few times. And then one of them said to me, "Um, what about you maybe take that online? Now, can I swear? Of course. Nick, do what you like. (laughs) That means that means piss off. We're done listening to you. That means we've had enough of you. Go and take that freaking shit somewhere else. Do do you think that teaching the people in work (laughs) helped their communication skills with each other in Mm -hmm. in a work environment? Because it'd have to help as well. Yeah, the girls told me, some of our senior staff told me that they'd done numerous management courses, but the little things that I taught them about life about life coaching and our limiting beliefs and how we um, do awkward conversations, they and told me that that helped them tenfold rather than management courses. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, so, it's, it's true communication skills. Um, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So then what, what happened from there? So I took it onto Facebook under a fake name. But I had a wee problem. I'm dyslexic. So if I wrote posts, I had to get them checked and all that there. So I decided I would do videos under fake name. There should be disconnect there. People right. were seeing my face. <laughs> so again, somebody came to me in work and said, is this you? Obviously, it's you, Lisa, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, it's brilliant. It's perfect. I was just doing little three minute slots. And then my son said to me, and um, this is probably about November 2019, he said, Mommy, there's a thing you can do on Facebook, you know, it's called lives. You could just do those. So I just sat at my kitchen table doing we lives. Then my older girl said, Mommy, Facebook, you got to get off that. That's just for mums. You got to get off that. You want this to happen, Mommy? You're going to have to go to Instagram. It's so amazing I- how much our teenagers help to push oh, us they're in these amazing. directions. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so went out one night and my hubby came home and my hubby was like, right, if this is going to be a real thing, we're going to have to do this properly. And I was like, okay, like until now I'm totally winging it. And he goes, I found you to name name on Instagram. So that was relationship.coaching.ni. And I, that was it. I then started doing courses in my local area in my community center for women to help them with their confidence, communication and Conflict. Yeah. The three C's. Um, And 10 people came and I just thought my shit didn't stink. I just thought this was brilliant. I was standing teaching women really on all that. And then you know what happened. Yeah. 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 So my little dream, my desire, my passion was dead in the water. And because I'm a life coach, I knew how to grieve. I knew it was wrong. I needed purpose every day to get up and put my makeup on and try to do something with my hair. Um, so I got on Instagram on the 23rd of March and said, I will be here every single day at 10 o'clock to do lives. Wow. I'm struggling and I'm a life coach. So you know what, whatever I'm, I might be crying half the mornings and I was crying half the mornings. 
at that stage, I had 500 followers and seven people came to that first live who, let's face it, were my friends and family. Um, but I kept at it. I just, it just, it filled me up. People started sending me nice messages. And then my number started, the blue square started coming on Instagram. Okay. And I took them to my children. I was like, these blue squares say following. I have no idea what that means. And this number over here is going up. I have no idea what either of those things mean. And my teenager said, someone is shouting you out. I was like, well, no. If we knew what those words were, that would be really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, next time it happens, bring your phone to us immediately. And I was like, okay. So next time it happened, I brought, she goes, Mommy, Sinead Haig and Louise McDonald are shouting you out. And I was like, Sinead's such a queen, like when it comes to like self-care and <laughs> minding yourself, like to get a shout out from even her would be amazing. Yeah. And I said, that's really nice of those girls, isn't it? And my girl said, well, my, they're influencers. And I said, now, what are they influencing exactly? And they said, people to follow you. And I went, okay, got it, got it, got it. I was like, well, I must say thank you. I, definitely, I must message and say thank you. And my girl's like, you can't be messaging Sinead Haig and Louise <laughs> McDonald, mommy. You can't. And I said, but look, it says right here, I can message them. Look, this wee button here says I can message them. So I just messaged them. And said, thank you very much. And they got back to me. You have to remember, we're in lockdown. We're yeah. struggling. The rules are out the window. So they messaged me back. I went on a live with them. They came on a live with me. Did Sinead's podcast. And the numbers just went ballistic. Mm. And I will not That's just incredible. And that's really putting yourself out there, though. But I suppose with COVID, you had nothing to lose, really. It was really good for your head being on every day. You were doing it anyway. And just- Oh, I forgot to say, I am menopausing in this situation as well. And here's the brilliant thing about menopause. I'm really going to swear now. I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> no one does. <laughs> I have done everything now. Yeah. There's actual science behind it that, you know, we, we, we give less of a fuck. Yeah after a certain age um the hormones all change and and it actually changes our attitude and people pleasing Mm -hmm. and so it's a it's just amazing and and like your story you were just compelled to make changes in your life right and so do you think have you have you have you seen this much with women coming into perimenopause and going through menopause is there a major change in the way that they think and in their relationships? And that's something we're very interested in learning about. Um, no, because I... obviously we have a huge menopause and perimenopause audience. And, you know, they're going through enough with all the symptoms, but also having to deal with their relationships then as well. And, and their bringing, kids. Bringing stuff to the surface, it brings stuff up. Because with the lack of estrogen, um, you have less of this nurturing hormone so <laughs> your your kids might be that bit older and you want to um you, st- you realize that you want to do something for yourself and you end up being you might be more creative or you want to mm-hmm. switch job or you want to switch relationship or maybe you hate your husband because <laughs> because of perimenopause and menopause maybe mm-hmm. you just need some counseling to fix it it's just it's kind of like um a time when everything just really bubbles up to the surface to be dealt and, with. And don't forget, right around this time, your parent, your own parents are getting older, mm-hmm. probably caring for an elderly, you know. I remember meeting someone in the school car park, oh God, this must be 10 years ago, and she was like, there should be a school for this time of life. These kids don't need this. We need a school for this time of life because it's that huge shift, you know. You really are a grown-up, you know. Mm-hmm. You really are a grown-up. Like my mom, I passed... When I was 41, you know, and there's a real huge like, oh, freaking hell. Really? Mm. I'm doing this now. I'm the boss of all this now. What's that? What's happening? I must I have to pull in that part of my journey through my stuff all around 43, 44 was that I went to Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. So I went lots. I went to therapy and I went to her and she started talking to me a lot about this next stage of life and this sort of um, uh, priestess stage, this sort of goddess stage was we, how, how she would say it, the crone energy would be another mm. word. That she would use. And it was just this, you got to go to my way now. 
I have raised my children. I'm living this next part of my life on my terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's a very empowering time if you approach it correctly, right? Because you kind of get in yourself back. You're in your power. You are the grown up one now, like he says. And so you can, you can make these decisions without having to think about too many other people because I suppose we spend most of our life doing that if we're caring for others, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, it is an empowering time, right? It's very empowering. I would say probably my, the Perry part was probably the most tricky for me. That sort of waiting for your period to arrive. I just, that drove me demented because that really low patch. I know you guys talk about this all the time that, you know, where you want to eat the whole box of roses and you, um, that really low part, that was probably the very hardest part for me. Or then your period arriving. I remember us. So the Mourn Mountains are quite close to us. I remember us walking in the Mourn Mountains and me going like, okay, whoa, stop. Everybody has to stop. Mommy needs to, you know, um, all that, I think, was the most difficult part for me. I don't know if this is a stupid thing that I did or what I did, but it worked for me. But I just took like the apps and everything that tell you when you're due your period. I took all those away. I took all those away and I just decided, I'm a wee bit pigheaded. I just decided not to think about that anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, it was bothering option, you. Yeah. It's a good, good approach. <laughs> I just thought, I'm not going to think about those dates. And you have to remember... At that stage, you've been probably thinking about those dates for 30 years. So it's a big shift, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. um, thinking about, oh, can I go to that? Will I be bleeding that day? What's my tummy going to be like? You've been thinking about that for 30 years by the time you get to this stage. So I just said I wasn't going to think about it anymore, which maybe is a bit simple minded. is it? I don't know. But no. it worked for me. No. It worked yeah. for me. It worked for me. Yeah. And Absolutely. then and then it just then the periods just started to stretch and stretch. And yeah, that was it. And that all happened during so a little bit pre-COVID and then all during COVID. And I have to say, having this business and really living my passion has helped me ma- magically through co- through menopause. So if there's anyone listening who's going through peri- perimenopause or menopause um, uh, and they're feeling this and they feel like they need, there's a major shift happening, they need to start making changes in their life. So what would you advise them to lean into those feelings to start exploring? What would you advise is a, is a good way and, yeah. and relationships as well at that time yeah. can be quite difficult. So yeah, two books I'd recommend. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So one book is come as you are. It's quite a, it's a, it's a, it's a deep dive. Um, and it's all about how we are conditioned around our periods. Um, and it's all about the patriarchal system and all that sort of stuff. And um, what's well, a bit about that, but, so it's very, quite historical. The, the lady who wrote that, Emily, can't remember her surname, has a Netflix special as well because it's called Women in Pleasure or Pleasure for Women, something like that. Okay. The other book I'd recommend if you're a little bit spiritual or woo-woo or a bit out there like me, who was definitely one of the ones that wasn't drowned, um, I would recommend um, Love Your Lady Landscape. Oh, I like the name <laughs> of that. <laughs> No, I had it lying around the house. I actually read it on a plane somewhere. And my hubby was like, seriously, Lisa? And I was like, yep, seriously, Nige. Um, so, and then I had it lying around the house and my teenage son said, well, my, you know what those are there on the front? So it's a late, it's like a silhouette of a lady. And then there's words on the cover. And my son went, that's meant to be her pubic hair. And I went, <laughs> oh, you're right, mate. It is. <laughs> <laughs> their mom reading all sorts of strange books <laughs> they're they're probably yeah. used to it now at this stage are they they're very yeah. used to it yeah. now. so yeah. those are two books i would recommend watch uh, listen to you guys obviously listen to you guys watch oh, um and just really push in to what it is to be a goddamn woman mm. you talked to her you talked earlier about the three C's. Can we mm-hmm. can we tell about those? Mm-hmm. So um, that, it was just the first week course. So confidence, communication, and conflict. And I just think they're so important for women women to learn. You know, um, because the more confident the bit we can be, the more we, we're better communicators, and the better we communicate, then the more we can, the better conflict we can have. Because healthy conflict is something that we absolutely need when mm-hmm. we're menopausing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you first about the love language. No, no this is great. This is the idea. <laughs> so go first. Love language. Yeah. Well, talk first. 
love languages. So this is a gentleman in America made this little tool, not complicated, um, and he gives it away for free, which is just so, so lovely. So if you go on to Google and you just put in free five love language test, you'll get this test. Okay, so okay. the love languages are time, touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, and gifts. Okay. You do the test and you get your significant other to do the test. Oh, so there's an actual test. I never knew there was an actual test. I just thought like you'd be like, no. oh, okay, it's I'm going to do test. this. It's a great way you did, mate. Me too. And you can do it with your children from their four years up. Okay, okay great. It saved me with my teenagers. Okay. Wow, because you yeah. felt like you understood them better. Yeah. And okay. as parents, it's a terrible thing. And we know we know better, but we parent every child in the same style. Yeah, and they okay. might they might not be okay. So, like, because I've seen a little bit about this on um, on TikTok. That's where I get loads of my information now these days. But it's it, people have done it, yeah, with kids. And some kids are not so much about hugging, but mm-hmm. they they might be more about the verbal communication kind of thing. And mm-hmm. it was just interesting. You don't have to wait until <laughs> you're in a relationship to find out your love language. Like you can literally do it with your family. I think it's a lovely idea. Actual test, get all your kids. My son, I met all his friends do it the other night. They're 14. Um, so 14, four 14 year old boys sitting in my kitchen. Doing <laughs> <language> <laughs> and so How did want. you get them to do that? <laughs> Guys love Guys love anything that's going to make love that's going to make life easier. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> I do love an L quiz now myself. This is great. So you do the quiz and it'll be like, do you prefer your partner to empty the dishwasher or bring you flowers? And you just tick the wee thing. Okay. And then it sends you a pie chart of what your love language, what your major love language is. Okay. Now, when I, my kids were wee and I was your guys' age, uh, my major love languages were time and acts of service. All I wanted my hobby to do was tidy up, fix something, do something Mm. and pay me attention. Okay. Okay. Now, my love languages are time and words of affirmation. Words okay. of affirmation as you go into your 50s and get a bit older and your body changes are so, so important. Touch is probably higher on my love language than it was when my kids were away. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, that term touched out, you know, like a hug sounded like the worst thing in the world for my, he's like, sure, give me a hug and make it better. I'm like, get off me. I have had kids on my boobs all day long. Yeah. And you're off, you know, that touched out. So now that's much freer for me. That's much better for me. There's nothing nicer than walking down the town hand in hand without any youngsters in a buggy. Um, you know, so all that stuff. So yeah, do the test. So obviously your love language changes throughout your life. So it's a, that's it's fascinating. An important one to, to, how often should you do it? How often should you do sure the test? Crack. Sure, sure. Sure. Um, sure. This is terribly sexist, but you might find that men's don't change so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, women, we do tend to change a lot throughout That's the month. Major. Maybe we should do it once a week. So we daily. <laughs> what about you did it daily and you sent your partner the results so they knew yeah. how to speak to you? Oh, there's a good app now. How's my missus feeling today? Yeah. <laughs> um, in that book, Love Your Lady Landscape, she talks about her partner. She calls him the Viking. And she's like, she just puts a little, she says she puts like a post-it up or something just to let him know that, um, you know, she's pre-period. And he knows then just to bring home wine and dark chocolate. And he just takes <laughs> glasses of red wine and dark chocolate spotted about the house and clears off. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she has him well trained. <laughs> so, you know, this lady's like back in, back in the day. Taking out me post-its. <laughs> yep. Take out the post-its. <laughs> You know, um, when when we bled, you know, thousands of years ago, we came together as women to help each other, mm. to care for each other. We didn't lean on men to understand what it's like to bleed out your vagina. I mean, mm. what the hell? That's just mental. Absolutely <laughs> mental, you know? And we've just come away. And also the other thing is, I love men, but we expect so much of them. We expect empathy when they cannot possibly empathize with what it is to bleed every month, to grow a human in your body, to push a human out your vagina mm. or have a C-section. 
we can sympathize and we expect them to sympathize, but they can't possibly, only women who have been through this journey can truly empathize. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to lean into each other for that and stop hating on men for not getting it. Yeah. Mm. We can't get stuff. We don't, we're not going to understand what it is to be a man. I have to be really careful. People come at me when there's, I'm talking about heterosexual couples, people who identify as female who own a vagina, people who identify as men who own a penis. That's how we have to say it nowadays. Anyway, here we are. So do your love language test on a regular basis. Um, The issue with the love language test is what we do is we speak love to our person how we want to receive love. Okay. Okay. Now, if your love language test comes back really even, you're going to have an easier relationship. Okay. Mm -hmm. My love language, my primary love language is time. My husband's primary love language is time. So that just happens really naturally for us. Mm. We don't really have to work on that a lot. Okay. My secondary love language at the minute is words of affirmation. His secondary love language is either touch or acts of service. Okay. What what is words of affirmation? Can you just explain? Your hair is so gorgeous, Donna. It is just stunning. So compliments. Right. Okay. They're like little mini confidence boosters. Yeah. Or I heard you on that podcast yesterday. You freaking killed it, babe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's all about being seen, heard, and celebrated. In our relationships, we must be seen, heard, and celebrated. You two must see, here and celebrate each other. Our partners must see, here and celebrate each other. Or maybe you two are partners. I didn't even think about that. No, we're cousins. We're cousins. <laughs> that would be weird if you're partners then. <laughs> our, two, our moms are <clears throat> sisters. So we go back a long way. <laughs> so do you know what I mean? So yeah. Um, it's how the love language are, is how we feel seen, heard, and celebrated or validated. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I might say to my hubby, that looks great on you. Um, did you get your hair cut? Oh, I heard you talking to so and so. Love the way you handle that. And he's like, okay, whatever. Doesn't speak love to him. But it comes naturally out of me because it's how I think love should be spoken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if he's out um, gathering leaves or cutting the grass or putting up Christmas lights and I bring him a cup of coffee and a biscuit, that's an act of service. And I give him a wee kiss or rub his leg or tell him that we're going to do whatever we're going to do tonight. You would think I was the queen of Sheba. Yeah. Right. So that's his love language. The that's cup of tea, the yeah. bit of affection and the, I suppose, acknowledgement that he did those things and that made you happy, right? This podcast is brought to you by our very own brand, Key For Her. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on keyforher.com. Please have 20% off on us by using the promo code KEYPODCAST in all capitals. Okay. So I absolutely. So I would coach couples all the time. And if it's a heterosexual couple, the guy would say, I do everything around this house. I do everything. I pick up the kids whenever I can. I clean, I have the house sitting and woman will say, I don't care. He thinks he's speaking love to her by mopping the floor. So she doesn't have to do it. All she wants is maybe time and words of affirmation or time and touch or a bunch of flowers. But maybe people mm. feel so frustrated because they, they don't have the skills then to be able mm. to communicate mm. that. And they mightn't even realize it themselves. It could be a case of, you know, it's just. Exactly. Yeah. And then what I, what I would get back sometimes is, but I don't know how to do that. So just because you don't speak, just don't speak Japanese doesn't mean you can't learn. Mm-hmm. So if, Words of affirmation are not natural to you. You're married to somebody or you're with somebody that words of affirmation are really important to. 
So we love these people. We care for these people. We respect these people. And we want our relationship to be great. Mm. So what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. And we're going to have to set a few alarms on our phone to tell our person that we're thinking about them or to send that emoji. Mm. I literally tell guys to set alarms on their phones and they're like, but then she'll know. And I'm like, she doesn't care. Do you think that if two people had very different love languages, I suppose if you don't realize you have very different love languages, that would be a root main cause of them having, say, a volatile or mad relationship, right? That this is the core of it. Yeah. The basics. It's like that, that example I just give you there now about when a guy's do, and either person is doing all the jobs, and the other person comes back and says, "Acts of service does not speak love to me. Mm. Time speaks love to me, so I don't feel loved or seen or heard or celebrated." They could save you seventy-five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny because when you hear conversations of people <laughs> that may have. Ha- um, had a partner have an affair on mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. and you might hear oh but your woman that he went off with she's mm-hmm. not even good looking but when you're looking at it you're probably thinking maybe she gave just gave him validation maybe she just made she was obviously speaking his love language and it was mm-hmm. enough to to mm-hmm. sway him and with so much conflict that can actually come up in this stage of your life and a lot of relationships they come to like um I suppose like a, a breaking point or mm-hmm. are they gonna go or stay um it's just an it's just an interesting thing that if you really don't find out each other's love language um that it could cause you know like a, a break where that's why you keep going back to the same so maybe Conflicts. we're going to be perimenopause or menopause and we're like, my partner is so needy. He just is rubbing my shoulders. He's smacking my backside. He wants to go out with me all the time. He's so needy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We do the love language test and we find out that his love language is time and touch. We're like, oh, they're not needy. This is how they would like to be loved. They're actually looking for love from us yeah Yeah, and it shifts the navel gazing which i hate onto how can we build this relationship okay we chose to be in relation with another so how can we build this how can we nurture this or we do our love language and we're like right now i just need words of affirmation because i'm really struggling and words of affirmation really make me feel loved Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your partner might think making you feel loved is rubbing your shoulders or saying he wants to have sex with you all the time. Yeah. Maybe that's his love language. Maybe he feels loved from physical sex. Mm. This disconnect that we have to get through, especially in peri and menopause. So it's about understanding the love language. Can I just think, uh, can I just talk about if, um, so if two people's love language is exactly the same, that's obviously going to flow real easy Mm -hmm. and their relationship's going to be easier. Right. Mm -hmm. But is there, is there something uh, with people that maybe they attract somebody with different love language? Mm -hmm. That's so, so we call that in my world polarity. So we love the opposite, you know, we love the opposite. So imagine if my husband was as mental as me, could you imagine the world would actually implode? So my husband is the strong, silent type. Yeah. Very encouraging. Very. But what happens is, as our relationship goes on, what we chose actually ends up driving us insane. So we Interesting. Must yeah. Because we for the polarity piece that we loved, that they were so different and they were so, you know, thoughtful and they were so this after years and years and years, our minds are programmed to go to the negative bias. So we start just bringing that, that just starts to become the forefront. And we forget the the loyalty, the commitment. We forget, well, it's almost like our- You get the ick <laughs> for what you, what you like them for in the first place. <laughs> yeah, so we have to guard against that. Mm-hmm. And we have, mm-hmm. to, um, we have to guard against that. And we have to say, no, this is what I love this person about this is what I love this person for um I did have an ex situation the other night um my hobby did so I can't remember what it was now 
but it was like something like that an old man would do. And my daughter was like, you're giving her the ick. You're giving mommy the ick. Stop doing that. So we laughed about it and got on with it. But yeah. Yeah. So, and we can say those sort of things. The other thing is when we've been with a person for so long, we can speak so cl- clearly and cleanly and be absolutely our authentic self, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Mm. That's the sort of thing we need to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's communicating that as well. I think it's it's so interesting this that maybe the love language, like you said, changes over time. Where you just maybe at the start your love language was aligned, and then it, mm-hmm. it, you changed, or he changed, or she changed, and um, yeah, it's about adapting to that and being very self aware. Isn't that what it is? And here's the thing: we do it all the time with our kids. So when my teenagers did my big girls here now grown and um, did their love language test one came back as same as me time and words of affirmation okay easy peasy my other daughters came back as were as acts of service and gifts okay now turn it at that time I was parenting them really both the same and the daughter's love language came back as acts of service and gifts I was parenting her like, how was your day? How was everything? Talk to mommy. Tell me everything. What's happening? Da, 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 da. I was following her to her room, like lying on her bed, like a cool mom, like, so what's happening with your wee life and blah, blah, blah. And she was looking at me like, get out of my space. You know, mm-hmm. she was transitioning and, you know, to being a grown up. She was trying to break away from me is what teenagers do. Um, and I was literally following after her like a wee puppy. So gifts are her thing so when I would see something out in the shop that I just thought like a two pounds thing you know um a little packet of crisps a little silly toy candle something silly I would just be like oh flowers her room she's way to uni and her room is still it's like a flipping botanical gardens um which I now have to water awesome and um, you know bringing her home a cactus da, 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 da. then I became a cool mom then I became the mom who she did come and speak to same as my husband taking her a cup of tea after school and two biscuits. She was like, thanks, mom. And then she'd come down the stairs and be like, you know what happened today, mom? Mm-hmm. So we can adapt for our children and we do it all the time. Yeah. But when it then- comes to our relationships, mm-mm, not so much. When it comes to friends as well, I know you said earlier, you know, when you were going through that kind of phase of wanting to change everything that, um, you know, maybe your beliefs and but your friends started to change. So talk a little bit about that. Well, I'm a minister's daughter. How I got here, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, here we are. So I had to come away from church mm. uh, because they didn't talk about menopause in church. And I was really wanting to talk about all the things. And yeah. we're also saying things about um people's sexuality that I didn't agree with anymore um which I kind of grew up just uh, under my head accepting is probably yeah yeah. and then you start thinking for yourself and go hold on a second and also was your oh sorry go ahead you hear it through your children's ears so my Mm -hmm. children were 13 14 the girls were 13 and 14 Jake was still quite young when I started hearing it falling on their ears I was like "Mm, I've personally had to do a lot of work to get over this shame and guilt I don't want them to have to do the same carry that on yeah and so did your friends your community (laughs) then all around you was very much entangled was it yeah and when I say that I went to church like I was a Sunday school leader I was running the mothers and toddlers like I was okay shit yeah. Um, so it was just such, it was just, again, we know we're tribal beings. Yeah. So it was just that coming away from my tribe caused me to yeah. start trying. So, and I still, lots of my friends still go to church and I still, mm. I say lots. I have five friends. Um, <laughs> but yeah. it's not about the amount of friends yeah. you have. It's the quality of friends that you have, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that had, all that came as a perfect storm. It was horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Mm. so I suppose then relationships with your friends um is there a love language with your friends it, mm-hmm. you know um and to make sure that you're treating your friends the right way here's a wee cheat if your friends won't do their love language test with you like you could have like a girly night it would be lovely what you it's can a great do idea yeah. what you can do is sit back and watch their behaviors and that will tell you what their love language is mm. so I have a friend who will bring you a little gift every time you meet her that's her love language. 
gifts. So it's about going, oh, I know what her love language is. Gifts, I'll bring her a wee gift. You know that friend who's always like, oh my days, I love your hair today. That top's gorgeous on you. I listened to the podcast last week. It was awesome. Her love language is words of affirmation. <laughs> Very interesting. It, I don't mean like sussing everybody out now. be just yeah. watching your head. <laughs> 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 I love that. Yes. Yeah. It's um, really nice. I have an interesting one. What like what do you think are the the top three things that people tend to come to you with with regards to relationships? So say like, you know, <coughs> partners, like what yeah. what are what are they coming with time and time again? So of the hundred couples that I've coached. I could probably count on, well, one hand, maybe two hands. Um, the amount of couples who come to me, either that there's been infidelity or a huge break in trust, whatever that might be, they've, they've gambled away the money, a, a huge break of trust, okay? Texting somebody or watching porn behind someone's back. A huge break of trust, okay? That is a very small proportion. Also think that people come to me because they know I'm a coach, because I'm always on Instagram saying, look, come before the wheels fall off. Come. Mm. So the two things that I majority, both things I teach people are love languages. And people come to me because they say they can't communicate anymore, which really means their conflict style is not good. And their love life has gone down the toilets. So they can't do conflict well, which then affects their sex life. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that's the major two things. And tell us a bit more about this uh, conflict style yeah. and how how to have an, a grown up adult disagreement slash argument. Where well, it don't go huffing. Well. <laughs> well, no first huffing all, and puffing. First of all, Renee, because you know you love a test. You have two more tests to do. Okay, right. I have my pet. One so the other, the next test I want you to do is your attachment style test. Okay, these are all free online. Um, so a gentleman wrote a book, again, I can't remember his name. The book's called Attached. You can read the book, obviously, but the wee test okay. is great. So we have, so there's three attachment styles. This is what the gentleman tells us. Um, and the first one is secure. So we're all very secure, grown up women here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Business women running their own, doing their own thing. Then we have anxious and then we have avoidant. Okay. Okay. So. The thing, the trick of the matter is that we run around our lives totally secure. But whenever we get into conflict, we tend to default to one of the other, anxious or avoidant. And you remember a minute ago, um, you'd asked Donna about how we attract the opposite. Mm. I cannot tell you. And when I figure this out and make millions, I'll let you know, girls, mm -hmm. why anxious. Well, I do sort of know. Anxious and avoidant attract each other like a moth to a flame. Mm. Okay. So yeah. how are they supposed to come to a conclusion when you so, have those? Yeah. Anxious says things like, I need to talk about it more. This isn't really over. How could this never happen again? I never want to fall out like this again. Never want to have this argument again. And avoidance like, okay, we have now beaten this to death. I'm not doing this ever again. Yeah, I'm not talking about it. It's done. And the, the anxious is sitting up in bed still like, Seriously, I'm not anywhere near the end of this situation. And there, your partner's rolled over and gone to sleep. Mm. Yeah. So anxious avoidant. First things first, recognizing it in ourselves. A lot of relationship stuff is actually the inner work. Yeah. Knowing our love language, knowing what our attachment style is. Mm -hmm. So my attachment style would be anxious. Okay. So I have to know, right? Okay, I'm getting anxious now. He's actually answered every one of my questions. He's actually now said, sorry, we've actually figured out why am I still being anxious? I need to do that work on me. Okay. Because we would have the argument and then I would still huff. Mm. Even though it had happened, that's anxious attachment style. Mm. I won't let you hurt me again. So I'm going to go over here into my corner. So you'll never hurt me again. And just to go back to that for mm -hmm. for a second, um, is it because you still feel hurt because you've had an argument and it takes time just to wear off? Because some people, mm -hmm. um, they can just say, right, I'm sorry. And you're like, okay, but you hurt me. So that's going to take some time for it to yeah. soften. Just, or like, 
there's two different things. There's sorry and there's accountability. Mm-hmm. So sometimes avoidance are very good at saying, okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Anxious attachment style needs accountability. Okay. So it's saying words like, okay, I'm feeling anxious right now. Can we talk a little bit about how we are both accountable in this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lots of the word we and I. Very little use of the word you. you. If I could take the word you out of couples, conflict, every the world would be a different place. And more with the, okay. um, I feel, and when you do this, it makes yeah. me feel a certain yeah. way. So, yeah, yeah. So it's about saying to that avoidant, I need a safe place to land and I need to be able to say all my words. Yeah. Yeah. So I will give you a silly example. I teach in parables, freaking turn into Jesus. Um, uh, so I have had those things on my teeth, you know, the Invisalign stuff on my teeth, mm-hmm. or in your teeth. Mm-hmm. So I was prancing around the other day saying, giving, you know, praising myself because my love language is this words of affirmation. So I might as well love myself in words of affirmation. <laughs> it's also very important. I love that. It's great. It's if your love language is time, give yourself time. Um, so prancing around and my hubby said, First of all, I will put this disclaimer out. My hubby thinks his job is to give me content. Okay. <laughs> for podcasts. I was thinking stuff to talk about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what, he makes sure that shit blows up, is it so that yeah. you have something to talk yeah. about? <laughs> and when, when we have a little row or anything, he goes, sure, that's just content, Lisa. That's great. And I'm like, yeah. really? Thanks. You didn't learn something extra Thank there. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. for Thank you so much for helping me, sweetheart. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> so I'm prancing around praising myself about my beautiful teeth. And my hubby said, "Mm, I really can't see any difference. I actually think it was a wee bit of a waste of money. Well, well, (laughs) well. (laughs) So years ago, this would have been a four-day knockdown row for us. But now that I'm all woke and all that there, so we talk about the red mist, you guys. So I could feel the red mist lift, descend, rise, whatever it is, okay? My hair standing on edge, which happens a lot through menopause, yeah? Yep. Um, as you say, we don't have that nurturing thing anymore, so we're just like, F you, I'm going to blow here, yeah? Mm. Great movie is Inside Out. I always say to people... If you're oh, watching, it's so yeah. good. Yeah. Mm, I watch it with my five-year-old. She exactly. she actually loves it as well. It's really good. It's really good. Mm. So the red mist is about to blow. So... um. This is where we need to take the little break. Mm. This is where we need to go and walk the dog, go to the utility room, maybe take ourselves to the bath, go out and um, go to the gym, whatever it is. Now, as time goes on, you can get this sorted out within a couple of minutes. So I took myself to the utility room and we want to ask ourselves, what do I feel right now? Under the anger, what am I feeling? Anger is the top of the volcano. It just spews but it's the emotions that fuel it. So what am I feeling? And sometimes we're so raging, we can't even, you know, when the red square goes ballistic and inside Mm. out, we can't even, we don't even know what the feeling is, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so what do I feel? I feel sad when my husband said he didn't notice my teeth any better. I feel, ooh, not seen. I feel undermined. Now, Brene Brown, who I actually am in love with, says that we only have like 20 words or something for our emotions, which is absolutely pathetic. So if you can come up with three, you're doing really, really well. Mm. Okay. So now the red mist has descended, has dissipated. I come to my person and I say, sweetheart, need a wee word. Okay. So remember, we're not saying the word you. Okay. And he might, when I say I need me, I need a wee word, he might say, um, mate, Sweetheart, I'm in the middle of something. Can we do that? And he's entitled to say that. That's fine. Okay. But thankfully he didn't. He said, yeah, okay, go ahead. Stick the kettle on. Because obviously we've done a bit. There's been a few years. We're a few years down the track here with this. He says, yes, what, what, what's, what's up, sweetheart? And I said, see there, we minute ago with that about my teeth. I feel sad. I feel unheard. I feel a wee bit undermined. Oh, sweetheart. I don't ever want to make you feel sad. I'm sorry about that. It gives them the opportunity when you say that because they didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And it's just, it's very, it's just 
you're not going straight into conflict. It's kind of like, let, hear, hear what I have to say. Literally building vulnerability and yeah. building a safe place. And when you're with someone who loves and respects and cares for you, what else are they going to say? Then, oh, I'm sorry about that. He did then continue to say, I don't really see much difference in your teeth. <laughs> I love and then it. you went back to the utility again. Yeah, no. <laughs> and then he came and then he said, because I just thought they were fine the way they were. I thought they were fine the way they were. I love you. I love the bones of you, including your teeth. So it just didn't really bother me. So it's just not important to me. But I don't want to hurt your feelings. Yeah, but it's important to you. So they have to recognize exactly. that as well. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the accountability part. Wow. You are just that's such lovely. a... A we're fascinating not- person to talk to. And we could literally talk to you for the entire week. I think. <laughs> we need to come back and do a part two. To Everybody this because- always says when I do a podcast with them, they're like, I think we may have just got a free session. I think we may have- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to hook you up for another one. <laughs> um, we always finish our podcasts on what are your three key tips. And so in your case, what are your key- uh, three key tips for relationships that you would give to our listeners? Okay. Do all those tests. Do your love language test. Do your attachment style test. And there's also an argument style test. Wow. Um, Writing that down. (laughs) So sorry, I know you want to finish. So there's um porcupines, golden retrievers, feral cat, and hermit (laughs) crabs. Sometimes I'm all four. (laughs) I put up I put up my Instagram and somebody got with 10 people got back and went, oh dear, I'm all four. And I'm especially (laughs) certain times of the month. I'm like awesome tell your person it's all about communicating with your person this yeah is feeling this is what's going on with me it's no reflection on you this is how I'm feeling inside I'm feeling like I'm burning inside I'm feeling like I it's all it's the, it's we have to do the inner work and share that with our person yeah mm-hmm. so do all those tests do all those tests and yeah do tons of work on yourself if you're struggling reach out and talk to someone invest money in your well-being mm. yeah yeah first time I went to therapy um I came home and my hubby said no sweetheart I'm just asking because you knew to tread very car I'm just asking um did you lift cash for that or and like how, just 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 want a heads up on you know how how much it is and I told him how much it was and he said okay could you pay her double because it's really working Ah, that's so cool. Oh my gosh. You're so, so lucky that it, it works so fast for you guys as well. That was when I, I went suppose. to therapy myself. That was when I did therapy myself. So okay. if you're struggling as an individual yeah. and you feel like you're, it's all your person's fault, it might be tons your person's fault. But yeah. A lot of work you're part of it. Yourselves. I, I really think um, social media has been has been incredible to opening up about people being vulnerable and talking about themselves and talking about, you know, their emotions and just, you know, dealing with their shit basically. And I've seen a lot of women on, you know, Instagram and TikTok, and they're now saying, you know, if there's someone interested in them in possibly having a relationship, the first thing they say is how much work have you done on yourself? Have you gone to therapy? Cause I need to know, cause if you haven't done any work, I'm not even going there. Yeah, You know, they're so, um, <clears throat> they're so understanding now of relationships and their self-care and um, having mental that little he- health, mental yeah. health yeah, and they're holding that space for themselves. And there's an awful lot of women now that are very happy being single because they're making themselves so happy. And it would take someone really amazing to come in, to allow someone in um, mm-hmm. to kind of change that up a bit in my day we were taught codependency so we yeah. were taught, um jerry Maguire, pretty woman oh and my I- god i keep having this conversation and the more i watch those older movies now oh. the more angry i get because mm-hmm. we were just sold this thing of the ultimate goal in your life is to go and find your dream man and oh. settle down and that's what you go and, and let's go do. further than that let's go further than that what about every fairy tale you read Oh my! What about every Disney movie that we watched? How There's to a Lose movie. a Guy in Ten Days yeah. was yeah. on on the weekend, and I used to love that movie. And now I like okay, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. he's right. I love him. I love him. Right, but I could look at him all day. Yeah. However, the thing is, it's so much based on just finding your dream man, and then your life mm. will be rosy. And what about making yourself happy? And when we went, when we started our journey, we were twenty five years codependent 
if he was happy, I was happy. If he had an opinion, I had an opinion. Yeah. We had no clue how to have our own opinions and respect the others when it was different. Yeah. No clue how to do that at all. So in answer to your three, three things, do all those tests, yeah. do the work on yourself, and then remember, it's two people who know how to fill their own cups. You know what I mean when I say that? Mm-hmm. Filling I love cup. that. Yeah. yeah. Filling your own cup, knowing your own awesomeness, knowing your enoughness, loving and accepting yourself, not needing anybody else to tell you words of affirmation are nice. But anyway, knowing that divine spark lives in you that is totally complete. And when you know that, and then you decide to build something with another, then you fill the relationship cup. Yeah. We hope people filling the relationship cup, building a relationship, and then the relationships relationship becomes a living being thing in itself. Yes. And then in conflict, we can see each other as individuals. But what we're doing right now is damaging our relationship. Yeah. It takes it away from that. You did, you did. So that would be my three bits. This has been fascinating. I've really enjoyed this. And I know we could talk for hours about this. I just love it. Like how do we not know all this stuff? What a lovely job you have. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you guys. so much. Um, how can our followers find you? So Instagram, um, relationship.coaching.ni, website, the same, relationship coach NI, I think that is. Um, and do you do Zooms? Like how, like what yeah. do you generally so do? There's, a, there's an ebook on there. Talked about all this stuff. It's like five ninety nine or something. Um, I also have a private memberships group that all my webinars that I did, that I did during COVID are in and I also go in there on a weekly basis and do questions and answers and things like that okay. and then I coach one-to-ones and then I coach couples and hopefully by the wow. time this is out I will have an online course up on my website Brilliant. fantastic thank you like, so much that's Lisa. fantastic if anybody thank you so is much. listening and wants me to come and speak live at their event or what I would love to do is like get a bunch of women together like just for the crack and just talk about other didn't even talk about sex didn't even talk about sex today yeah. sex is so so important in your relationship otherwise you become roommates and sex during perimenopause and menopause is so important because it's such a great release of cortisol and we really do stock up on the cortisol when we're going through peri, peri. and orgasm is such a great release of cortisol so talk to your person about when you're going to have sex and yeah. why it needs to happen. Or give yourself some pleasure as well. I was also going to say that. I just didn't know how far to go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, That can be a great, great thing. And, and when we go through menopause and uh, perimen, you're almost discovering your body over again because it is mm. it's changing and it's developing and hormonally and all the things. It's almost it's a rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. So finding out who we actually are, all the bits. Get it's all of. releasing. Let it go. All the bits <laughs> to keep your bits happy. <laughs> keep your bits happy. Sorry, let's end on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on the Key for Her podcast. We'd be so grateful if you could hit subscribe, rate and share this podcast with your friends. For tips, tricks and hacks and all things perimenopause, menopause, periods, menstrual cycles and skin health, Follow us at Key For Her on TikTok and Instagram. Check out our website, keyforher.com for more information.